For the first minute of this story, I want to take you back to one of the most puzzling chapters in wartime engineering, a chapter that still confuses modern material scientists today. During the Second World War, soldiers fought through winters so severe that vehicles froze in place. Weapons jammed with ice and entire supply routes vanished beneath blizzards. Yet scattered throughout field diaries and quartermaster logs is a repeated claim about a strange, improvised heating trick. It had no advanced chemistry, no special design, and looked unimpressive. But the soldiers who used it swore that it provided more warmth than any standard issue gear of the time. The source of this strange warmth was a simple multi-layered fiber mat issued mainly to mountain troops, reconnaissance teams, and long-range patrol units. At first glance, it looked like a rough mixture of felt, cellulose, and leftover textile fibers, thin, light, and cheaply produced. Nothing about it seemed special. Yet when soldiers placed this mat beneath their coats, ground sheets, or bedrolls, it created a dramatic increase in heat retention. Troops on the Eastern Front described sleeping through freezing nights that immobilized entire units, crediting this crude mat for preventing frostbite. This phenomenon troubled engineers even during the war. When they tested the mat under controlled laboratory conditions, its insulation levels were completely ordinary. But the field reports kept coming in, all describing a material that performed far better in real-world conditions than in any test chamber. Over decades, scientists have tried to explain why the mat's effectiveness dropped when tested properly. The best explanation seems to involve an unusual combination of pressure, moisture, and chaotic fiber layering that simply cannot be replicated in clean, dry laboratory environments. Under body weight, the mat compressed into a dense structure that slowed heat loss more effectively than thicker wool layers. Even more strangely, it performed better when exposed to moisture something almost unheard of in insulating materials. The mixture of synthetic and organic fibers created tiny channels that trapped warm air, even when damp. As these fibers swelled with moisture, the mat reorganized into a semi-sealed grid that blocked conductive heat loss from both above and below. Modern engineers still debate why irregular compression like lying on snow, mud, or uneven ground seemed to activate the mat's insulating ability in a way mechanical testing never could. The effect becomes easier to understand if you've ever worked with wool felt. Felt stays warm even when wet because its fibers interlock tightly enough to block rapid heat escape. The wartime mat took this principle even further by blending fibers of different densities and absorption rates. This created zones that behaved differently under pressure, forming a protective structure that ordinary testing methods simply don't trigger. Today, survivalists occasionally rediscover this principle when old carpet padding or saddle felt suddenly insulates far better under real camping conditions than on a clean test bench. Some mountain units cut their mats into fitted shapes to line the floors of stone huts. Skiing patrols traveling for days in sub-zero temperatures often carried just two warming items, a wool blanket and this mat. Many trusted it more than any heavy bedding they could have carried. Soldiers also noted that when two people slept close together on a single mat, the warmth increased dramatically, an effect modern survival experts now recognize as shared. Insulation combined with reduced conductive heat loss. The inconsistency of these mats in laboratory tests still bothers researchers. Some believe that surviving samples have degraded over time and no longer reflect their original condition. Others argue that the heat generated by a human body interacts with layered fibers in ways that electric heating plates simply cannot reproduce. There is also a theory that wartime dyes, preservatives, and antimold treatments change the fibers enough to enhance their thermal behavior a recipe that modern reproductions cannot replicate with complete accuracy. Regardless of the reason, the field reports are too consistent to ignore. Soldiers slept warm in conditions that should have caused hypothermia. Officers sometimes recorded that a single mat kept two men warm enough to survive a night when others suffered cold-related injuries. This points to a larger survival lesson. In cold weather, 
The most important insulation is beneath the body, not above it. A dense, stable, non-compressible barrier between you and the ground can have a greater effect on warmth than an extra blanket on top. If you want to apply this forgotten wartime principle today, start with your ground barrier first. Build a layer that resists compression and traps air even when damp. Wool felt, compressed plant fiber mats, or repurposed textile pads all work surprisingly well. Add a moisture-managing layer above that and then place your warmth layer on top. This order matters more than most people realize, and you can feel the difference immediately. The real value of this World War II heating trick does into lie in recreating the exact mat. Its production methods, fiber blends, and chemical treatments belong to a different era. The value lies in the survival principles it unknowingly revealed. Moisture doesn't always ruin insulation. Dense fibers can outperform fluffy ones, and irregular pressure can activate thermal properties that clean laboratory tests never detect. Most importantly, effective cold weather survival begins beneath the body, not above it. If you enjoy exploring forgotten technologies and the practical lessons they still offer, consider sharing this story. Hidden inside old wartime gear are countless innovations, some crude, some accidental, but many far ahead of their time waiting to be rediscovered once again.